Welcome to the Great Grange Stone Circle, one of Loch Gur's finest monuments and believed to be one of the oldest and largest stone circles in Ireland. Welcome to this, our final episode of our webinar series. The first episode focused on traditional archaeology and history, the second on spirit of place, and this, our third and final episode, will focus on the connection between Loch Gur, science, archaeoastronomy and symbolism. Speakers tonight include Dr. Nora Patton, Dr. Niall Smith and Dr. Frank Prendergast. Our Master of Ceremonies this evening is Paul Ryan, Senior Director of WP Engine and longtime supporter of Loch Gur. Paul is also a member of the Voluntary Advisory Group for Loch Gur and he is spearheading our Dark Sky initiatives. So I hand you back to Paul now to introduce our first speaker. Hey, thanks for that, Kate. And folks, that was Kate Harold, manager here at Loch Gur. And as Kate mentioned, my name is Paul Ryan. Uh, by day, I'm a manager at WP Engine, but at night I masquerade as a Loch Gur volunteer, amateur astronomy and would-be rocket scientist. Uh, and welcome to this third webinar in the series and tonight's uh, Archaeoastronomy and Symbolism, um, a big lofty topic, but we hope to make it a really engaging session for you with some of the great speakers that we have. But before we kick off, just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. So down below me here, you, if you're looking at your Zoom window, you'll probably see a Q&A button. If during the night you want to raise a question for any of our speakers, myself, Paul, Nora, Frank or Niall, just pop it in there and we will have a Q&A session towards the end and we'll hopefully get to your questions. Tonight's session is being recorded, so if you need to drop out, if something, if something comes up and you need to drop off the session, don't worry. We will be sharing the link afterwards and you'll find us on YouTube. And actually, just to say that, we're streaming live on YouTube for the first time tonight, so no pressure on any of our speakers. So what is tonight really about? It's a story of human curiosity with the heavens. Why do we look to the stars? Why do we get excited when NASA lands a rover on Mars? Why do kids just see wonder and awe in rockets and in the stories of astronauts? And why would a group of people over 6,000 years ago build a stone circle next to a lake? Well, we'll find out more about that a little later. I just want to thank our speakers, Nora Patton, Frank Prindergast, Niall Smith, and we have some other guests along the way for their time this evening. And we hope that you enjoyed the session. I must say, I've known these guys for over 10 years. And each time we sit for a beer, we get to enjoy some great stories. And this isn't just a topic for space geeks. This is a topic for everybody. So again, after the session, if you find it interesting, we'd love for you to share the story of Locker, but also this session. It's not about just about Locker itself, but themes of exploration and curiosity through humanity. So what is Locker? I'll just take a second to explain. On the map of Ireland here on my screen, you'll see there's a little red dot about 20 kilometers south of Limerick City here in Ireland on the West Coast. And Lockbur is the local lake. And at one end, you saw the stone circle that Kate was in there a few moments ago. And at the other end, we have our heritage center where visitors flock to each day. The heritage center itself is used as an education center, especially with primary and secondary school students, where we share a lot of STEM subjects, uh, again, in partnership with our speakers here tonight. Locker is also an SFI accredited site, and it's also a community group. So the Locker Development Group is actually a group within the community, non-for-profit, whose mission it is to preserve the history, the site, but also share it with the world and encourage people to keep the stories going. I've been lucky. I've been living in the area here for 30 plus years. I grew up in the Locker area. Lock area. And having traveled the world, I've returned to Locker. And I think a lot of it is just the, the magic of it that draws you back. And along the way, I've been, had a great opportunity to take many visitors to Locker. And a few, number of years back, I brought Apollo 15 astronaut Al Warden to Locker. And little did I know at the time, but Al's second passion was archaeoastronomy and wondering why cultures through the ages have looked to the heavens. So Al was hooked. He came back time and time again to Ireland. And over that period of time, he did various events, student events with Locker. And we have had over a thousand Limerick based students meet an astronaut. That's phenomenal. You know, for a kid in the countryside like me growing up in the 70s, I never dreamed that I would meet an astronaut, let alone take one around and share that passion with children. One of the key things that Al would often tee up was that there's no such thing as zero gravity. It was his pet hate. Um, what you find in space is microgravity. And for me, this now allows me to stop speaking and transfer you over to Nora Patton, who's going to take us through some of her story. Um, so, Nora, I'll pass it to you. I'll let you introduce yourself to the audience and take it away. 
Thank you very much, Paul, and good evening, everyone. Um, as much as I'd love to be with you all in person, these uh, online virtual uh, events are also equally great um, just to connect and stay connected. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, able to uh, join this panel tonight. Um, I was thinking before I came on, my, my gosh, like uh, Frank and, and uh, Niall are both uh, very tough acts to follow. So uh, thank you to Kate and to Paul for putting me first. It makes my life a little bit easier uh, on this Monday evening. Um, so I think uh, Paul's introduction was fabulous in terms of, you know, what is Locker, um, a bit of the history about it. And I really hope that uh, us three speakers tonight can complement each other in terms of our very different perspectives and our different backgrounds. Um, I'd like to share, I suppose, um, I'd like to focus on the science and um, the outreach, the engagement. And really, I've thought about Loch Gur and the likes of Mayo Dark Skies and these fabulous areas in Ireland and really just how unique they are and how they can really shape the next generation. Um, and so on that perspective or on that thought, I'd like to rewind quite a number of years uh, at this stage. Um, but when I was in primary school, I had an amazing opportunity. Uh, I got to go to visit NASA in Cleveland, Ohio. And I suppose we were on a family holiday. My, my dad's side of the family um, moved to Cleveland um, and also my mother's sister um, lives in Cleveland. So we have a whole load of relations over there. And so when I was in primary school, uh, we got on an aircraft, first time uh, on an airplane, first time going to America. Excitement was great, as you can all imagine. And I was growing up in Mayo at the time. And so these experiences of going to places, of visiting something new, of experiencing something new, um, was actually life changing. You know, when I think back, that trip to NASA changed the course of my life and it changed my interests and um, it changed you know my whole thought on what I could do and what I might want to do with my life as I progressed into secondary school and onwards uh, into university and so I often you know think back to that time now as an adult having gone through all of these various different um uh, space courses and degrees and all of this um, and I think back to that time um, because when I'm giving talks and talking to parents and to kids uh, parents often ask me you know Nora how do I get my kid interested in STEM or interested in space and I think back to that visit to NASA and I'm the youngest of five and I'm the only one in the family to really have gra gr like grabbed that interest in space and thought, wow, this is really what I want to do with my life. And so when I'm talking to parents now, I think, you know, it's never a one size fits all. It's this um, experience driven interest. And I think kids are naturally so curious. Um, and so I say to parents, um, bring kids to experience as much as you possibly can, because you never know what it is that's going to get them interested in whatever it is that, that their curiosity um, brings them to. And so um, I think Loch Gur has such a fabulous um, perspective on uh, the night sky, on the dark sky, on, you know, the, the lack of sound pollution, all of these kind of things. And that's what I'd really like to talk a little bit about um, tonight in terms of how I see um, Locker fitting in with the science, the space, the outreach, um, and how the experience of going to Locker can really facilitate um, uh, conversations about the ecosystem, about the environment that we live on, in here on Earth um, and about our place in the universe and our place uh, on, Earth, on our planet Earth. And so uh, I, I, I think back, uh, you know, to, to growing up in Mayo and I think it was the awareness of something different. Um, Having the trip to NASA was kind of this seed of interest in space. And at the time, I had absolutely no idea 
how I was going to pave this path forward. But the important thing was, was having this interest. And so um, I was growing up, growing up in a town called Ballina. And to be honest, uh, the night sky wasn't as crystal clear as it is in the dark sky areas um, of Ireland. Um, and so when I was 14, I actually saved up my babysitting money and I bought my first telescope. And even though at the time I really couldn't see very much from my house, that's not really the point. I think back and I think, you know, it was that curiosity. I stood outside and I became more aware of these things. I became more aware of the night sky. I became more aware of astronauts and space exploration. Um, and I suppose something much, much bigger. And so um, as, as Paul said in his um, introduction, space offers such a unique platform to inspire um, not just young people but people of all ages um, you know uh, I'm sure there's many many of you guys watching who've been following all of the really amazing things that have been happening in space in the past um, week even and um, the European Space Agency has just announced uh, a new call for astronauts which is super exciting the first call in over 11 years and I thought what was really interesting about the press conference um, just last week was really the focus on really getting this idea out that it's not just about the astronauts it's about all of the space careers that feed into sending astronauts to space all of the technology the food science the medicine the stem careers the astronomy um, and so I think that's a really, really key thing that um, is being, you know, is for all of these young people coming up, they're getting to see all of these different careers that are feeding into a, a much bigger picture of space. And I think Locker has such a, as I mentioned, just such a lovely opportunity and a lovely platform there to showcase lots of these different careers and what they're doing with the primary science center and all of those things is just so important. And so even with the landing, the Mars landing, uh, Perseverance and the Ingenuity uh, helicopter, a super exciting time, three missions arriving at Mars in February, there's been a huge interest in people following space. They want to know what's going on. Um, and I just think it's been such, such an amazing week uh, when we look at all of these, um, these missions and these um, things coming, coming on. Um, not forgetting the International Space Station, 20 years of continuous continuously habiting uh, the International Space Station. So what I think now is pretty amazing is anybody watching that is less than 20 years old um, has lived in a time where we have lived off Earth. We've had a human presence in space. Um, and I think how, how incredible, you know, it's, it's for, for, for people growing up now, they're living in a, in a really, really interesting time, um, a really unique time. And I think a time where there is space for everyone in space. And I think that's a really wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, amateur radio is making it possible for kids across uh, Ireland and across other uh, parts of the world to connect with the International Space Station, to talk to astronauts on board, to ask them questions, you know, what is it like to live up there, to work up there, what kind of science are they doing? Um, and so I think um, when you look at the International Space Station and what it's doing, it has really been a platform for a huge amount of uh, microgravity research. Um, uh, and I think the next 10 years, we'll see an awful lot more of what's been happening, being published and the actual impacts of that. Um, but also it's, it's allowed a huge engagement from an outreach perspective. And I'd like to get into a couple of those um, outreach programs shortly. Um, and really, I suppose um, when I think back to 
that kid growing up in Mayo. Um, I got to visit NASA again when I was a teenager to keep that interest in space alive. And that was a really, really important thing. Um, because you know yourself when you're in secondary school, you can quite easily get knocked off course. But having those experiences, I actually think are, are fundamental um, to ourselves and our, our progression. And over the years, I've been very interested in the engagement side, the outreach side. And so I've asked a number of colleagues at the International Space University and at different organizations here in Ireland, you know, what was it that got you interested in STEM and in your career? And I'm sure you'll hear from Niall in terms of how he got interested. But there's a whole variety of reasons as to why people took the interest they took. And, um, you know, for me, it was a trip to NASA. For some, I'm sure it'll be a trip to Locker. So for some, Locker will be my NASA. For others, it's books, it's films, it's meeting someone. So as Paul said, um, think of all of those kids haven't had an opportunity to meet with an Apollo astronaut, Al Warden. Amazing. Um, and you just don't know who out of those um, kids that have met him will be the next um, person in Ireland aiming to get to space or aiming to do astronomy or whatever it is. Um, so all of those things, I suppose, shape us as a person. And I, I suppose... Um, I often think is that why I'm so drawn to do outreach because um, growing up in Ireland, I would have loved to have had more opportunities to get involved in space. Um, and so I think there's many, many ways that we can share experiences. Um, Paul did an unbelievable job with bringing Al Warden to Ireland and really sharing that experience with so many people um, in Ireland. Um, and so, um, when I think about Locker and when I look at Locker, I think about uh, multiple things. Um, I think about the environment, the location, the ecosystem, um, as well as the history that it that it is there. And I think Frank put it very, very nicely on his uh, Live 95 interview uh, just recently. And he said, Locker is a place of special importance to view the sky and an element of our heritage conserved for future generations. And I think that's really, really important. And, um, you know, conserved for future generations, it's part of our heritage. And really, when you think about it, Locker is probably less than a handful of places in Ireland that can give the experience of the dark sky, the history, um, the, the, the lack of sound pollution, all of those elements. Um, so it's, it's really got a unique um, selling point, I think. And I've spoken with uh, Kate before about this um, and also spoken with Mayo Dark Skies about this link between space, between locker and between the environment and how can we link the three? And I want to, uh, I have a couple of videos that I'd like to, to show and talk through because um, I, I have had an amazing opportunity of flying as a researcher on a microgravity flight. And um, as Paul said, there's no such thing as zero gravity, it's microgravity. Um, there, the, so I, I want to talk a little bit about those flights and I suppose how it shaped my perspective. And um, again, it comes back to experiences. And, you know, over the years, I had studied engineering in college and gone to the International Space University, done all the kind of book work. But through the citizen science program and through the evolution of commercial space, I've had an opportunity to do very hands on uh, elements of what it takes to get to space. Um, so we've had an opportunity to test spacesuits, um, IVA, so intervehicular activity spacesuits that they wear inside the vehicle uh, on the way to the, the space station or up to space. Um, and th th these kind of things are enabled through commercial space. And that in itself has been an unbelievable uh, evolution over the past kind of decade or so. And so um, when I did the, the microgravity uh, research flight, we, we flew on these as researchers and we got to test different payloads and we got to actually experience what that feeling is of floating. 
Um, and it was one of the most amazing experiences that I've had. And um, this experience of weightlessness, and I can only imagine what the astronauts on the ISS are living in uh, all the time up there as they're orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes. Um, and they're in this constant freefall uh, environment. So they're floating all the time. Um, and it gave me, I suppose, a sense of just how adapted we are for life on Earth and just how, um, how much we've evolved in this Earth environment. And so uh, I, I'm going to just share a little video of the, um, the microgravity flight just to give you a sense of what that was, what that was like um, to float in microgravity. So in the video, you can see we was a small enough aircraft. It was a Falcon 20 jet that we were on, but um, it was still such an incredible opportunity to experience what that was like. And it gave me a sense of even if you're planning something to go to the space station, for example, uh, you know, if you're putting a new toilet up there or you're bringing new experiments up there, you really have to plan it for the environment that it's in. Um, so uh, the microgravity environment, the weightless environment is just so completely different. Um, and I think what's been really lovely is that I've really been able to bring some of these exp these experiences back to people in Ireland um, through through different projects over the years. Um, but I thought this was a nice one that would fit in uh, with this whole notion of this interconnectedness of locker, the environment and space. And so in 2019, we established uh, the Possum 13 initiative, which was really to set out to engage um, young girls in space science and to offer them an opportunity to get involved on the hands on side um, of space science. And so this was the, a project we ran in 2019. We pushed it out to teenagers in Ireland um, to design an experiment that would be tested on a microgravity flight uh, over in uh, the National Research Council uh, in Canada uh, in collaboration with Possum. And so I just have a little video here about the project and what that was all about. We are here today to announce the winner of the ICOMP Possum microgravity experiment that's been designed by teenagers in Ireland and will fly on a parabolic flight this October. The winning team had a really fantastic application and they also had a really nice video to demonstrate what their project was about, uh, the teamwork, the innovation behind why they wanted to research this in microgravity. And so they had the opportunity to come to the University of Limerick today and present on their work. It's basically an attempt to find alternative methods for um, food sources in space. Obviously there's huge environmental impacts in sending spaceships constantly up to the International Space Station and we wanted to find a way of growing plants in space and of course plants have features that are, I mean they're suited to Earth gravity and we wanted to see if we'd be able to overcome those and to be able to grow them in microgravity. And I think what's lovely about offering these kind of opportunities to young people is to see uh, what they come back with in terms of what kind of experiments they're interested in looking at, what kind of designs. Um, and even when you look at the likes of the BT Young Scientist, um, you can see that they're very interested in the likes of climate change. Um, how do we make things more sustainable? Um, you could see there even with this, with this group of young people, they wanted to look at food sources, so sustainable food sources. Um, and many of the things that are developed for space or uh, you know, for living in space has certainly transferred back um, and had ben ha has had benefits um, here on Earth. And so you might think, well, what has that got to do with Locker? Um, I think it has a lot got to do with Locker. Um, when, we, when we look at, and as Paul mentioned uh, in the intro, um, 
the, the, the centre has the Discover Centre, the Science Foundation Ireland Discover Centre accreditation. And they do amazing workshops and outreach and engagement with lots of different young people. Um, and I think it provides such, such an incredible perspective. And um, when you look at the, as I said, the, the dark sky, um, and it gets them thinking, you know, it gets young people thinking, well, what's what's different? What's my interest? And as I said, you never know which of those little kids will come to Locker and think, well, I want to be the next astronomer or I want to be a scientist. And I think in opening up the doors for conversation with them, um, who knows where it'll be? And so um, I love, love, love this uh, backdrop that um, Paul has provided us uh, by, it's by a local photographer. Um, and I look at this and what I think is that um, I don't know when the last time I've seen that kind of sky. So I live in Dublin and it's totally light polluted. Um, I really can only see probably a handful of stars. Um, and I don't think we, I think we should really be careful not to lose this. Um, because once it's lost, it's very hard um, to get back. And so, um, Linking this back with Locker, um, there are a number of really lovely initiatives that have been done on the space station that feed in with this notion of the environment, space, science. Um, and I'd like to talk very briefly about two of them. Um, so Tomato Sphere is one project that has been running for almost uh, 20 years now. Um, it was founded by, uh, co-founded by a Canadian astronaut, Bob Persk, um, who myself and Niall met recently, actually, in Ireland. Um, and I think this is just a lovely example of how simple experiments like seeds can have a huge reach in terms of the amount of um, young people that can be uh, impacted um, by projects like this. So Tomato Sphere have a lovely... Um, tagline and it's uh, sowing the seeds of discovery uh, through student science and through through tomato sphere they fly bags of tomato seeds to the international space station and the the seeds stay on the iss for a number of weeks or a number of months or a set duration and through that project they have engaged 3.3 million students um, since 2001, which is which is just incredible. And it's really about um, giving educators a platform to uh, work with kids, to get them thinking about different environments. When we change an environment, what impact that has. And so I really think there's a, there's a really good connection there between seeds in space, uh, the ecosystem, and how microgravity changes things, how light pollution changes things, how sound pollution changes things. Um, and so I think there's a really lovely link there um, in terms of what we can do in space and what we can do in the likes of Locker. Um, what I thought was lovely about the likes of Tomato Sphere is that the classrooms, the, re the, the classrooms get packs of seeds, some that have flown in space, some that haven't. They're not told which is which. Uh, and then they they undertake these real uh, scientific investigations and they report back in terms of um, what they have found and what what um, effects the um, microgravity environment has had on the seeds. And Tim Peake ran a very similar one um, in uh, the UK ESA astronaut. He flew uh, rocket seeds and that was a, a collaboration between the Royal Horticultural Society and the UK Space Agency. And that project in the UK reached 600,000 students um, and again tested the, the rocket seeds and looked at how they varied. Um, so I really think it gets the kids thinking about the environment of space, our environment on Earth, and what changes are made and how that impacts. And so just to finish up, um, I really think Locker has a very unique perspective on this in terms of the quiet zone, the dark sky 
and it can be used as a lovely platform to to really look at how changing environments can impact ecosystems and us as humans and so I very much look forward to working with Kate and Paul and all the team and I just want to say a huge kudos they've done amazing work uh, over the past few years um, and so well done and thanks again. Thanks for that Nora and, and again I uh, just want to recognize the efforts that Nora is doing on behalf of science and outreach not just at Lockard but a nationally as well so Nora is a, is a a huge advocate of STEM, uh, you know, an inspiration to many, an inspiration to women in engineering as well. And of course, Nora, I'm sure you have your name down there for a spot on the uh, as an ESA astronaut as well, coming up shortly. Now, Nora mentioned about it's the small things that can often inspire somebody. And I dashed to my shelf here beside me because, believe it or not, my story started with a poetry competition. And I won a gift voucher for a bookshop in Limerick City. And out of that, I bought the history of NASA. This book has traveled with me around the world. It's been read time and time again as a kid. Um, but certainly was the source of my inspiration and passion as well to, to look further to the stars into the space program. Nora mentioned our fabulous background. I just want to recognize Brian Lavelle, a local photographer who took this picture from the shore of the lake. And it is not doctored in any way. There is no photoshopping. The dots you see at the bottom of the screen are the stars reflecting on a very, very still locker lake um, late at night. This is not the first time I've been on a session or on a stage with, uh, with, uh, with Nora or Niall or Frank, but it's the first time I've been with them together in one event. And each time I remind them and myself that I'm the least qualified person in the group, Dr. Patton, Dr. Prendergast, and Dr. Smith. Uh, and of course, I'm just Paul Ryan. Um, but you know, science isn't just for, uh, for the, the intellectuals, for the universities, for the research centers. Science is for everybody out there, as Nora pointed out, uh, for our students and for kids alike. And so we've got a small segment now with Frank Ryan, who uh, is an amateur astronomer with the Limerick Astronomy Group. And he's speaking with Kate about some of the experiences they have here with the nice guys at Lockhart. So we can roll that video now. Thank you. I would like to introduce you to Frank Ryan. Frank is a Limerick man living in Clare, past chairman and current public relations officer for Limerick Astronomy Club. So you're going to have to uh, explain and describe for visitors because of course we can't film live from there at the moment with these restrictions. The main reason why we use Lacker um, is because it's very close to our kind of base. Uh, most of our club members um, come from actually the environs around Lacker and Limerick and we do have club members that are from further afield because we take in Limerick, Clare and Tipperary and a lot of the people that would be um, looking for a place to observe are, are looking for two things. They're looking for some place that's uh, dark and some place that's safe. And really, Locker kind of ticks those boxes. So not alone is it close to us, it's actually um, very dark for, for how close it is to a, um, a built up area. Um, and it's also very safe as well. We feel oftentimes when we're observing, uh, especially in re remote locations, um, you, you're kind of wary because, you know, a car comes, comes by, uh, you don't know what, what might happen. Oftentimes it's the police coming to find out why we have all of these lasers pointing into the sky <laughs> or big telescopes. But after we show them a couple of objects, they're more than happy to, to, to move on. But I suppose the other um, reason why we use Lockgar as well is because of the physical attributes to it. Um, and what I mean by that is, the lake itself is a great place to observe uh, um, over. So if you can imagine, um, you know, if you're on a, the old kind of explanation really is uh, if you see a, a car, top of a car on a hot summer's day, you'll see the shimmer. Um, and that's the atmosphere being distorted by heat. So similarly, if you have a cold uh, body, such as a lake, um, the air above it is going to be quite still. Um, or a little bit more still than the surrounding area. So whilst the land is giving off heat from, the, from a summer's day and you get quite a lot of shimmer, which makes it very difficult to um, observe through, the lake itself creates this laminar uh, section of air, which actually cuts through the atmosphere and you get a much better, um, clearer view. So it's got that attribute, which is quite hard to find, especially south facing. So it's fine if you have this in a, a north facing or even east facing, but you know, the Goldilocks zone is that you'd have this in a south-facing environment. 
So I suppose uh, what you're saying is the locker is just perfect for um, a club like your own club to come and view the night sky does, yeah. for many reasons, as you say, in terms of security, it's a safe place, the dark sky quality. And then you have the added bonus of having the natural lake there. I, I just think, you know, you are an astrophotographer as well. And even to show images that you have taken, even your own background, I would think, is that one of your own photographs that you have taken there? Or is that from... It is. Else? It's, um, I think, in the background there, we have uh, the moon just setting over um, Blackfell and you have um, you have Venus above it. Um, I can, I can show some... Um, I'll share my screen and I can show some... Uh, images that kind of explain, yeah, uh, I guess, do. why we <laughs> really use lacquer exactly. as much as possible. Um, sorry, yeah. So this is um, this is the group setting up. Um, obviously, we've <laughs> we've clouds to contend with, and you know, a lot of the times, actually, the the lake as well will help with the um, the, the, the 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 clouds because it actually prevents cloud from forming above the lake, which is a, another reason why we would go. Um, also, you have in the um, to the back of us or to the north of us, you've got um, a lovely set of trees. It's it's actually where the um, the center is, <clears throat> and what that does is it actually really cuts down on the amount of wind because, as you can see with the scopes that we use, a lot of them, um, if it's windy, you're going to have some problems with the scopes. Uh, being kind of thrown around so you kind of have to have all of those um, tick all those boxes so you have to have dark sky you know good uh, good quality of air um, safe and also someplace that's not um, going to be very um, obstructive in terms of wind oftentimes people think that you really should go as high as possible you know why don't you go to the top of a mountain well number one it's freezing cold up there and number two you're going to have very big problems with wind so it's fine for the big uh, professional observatories to be up there because obviously they're within a dome but if you're out in the elements it's not going to be, um, and it's I, not going to be I, very good just from looking at what's there in the photograph i take it you don't you didn't get this from the local toy shop that you know being part of a club such as you are that you know you have access to all of this um you know very top of the range equipment that you necessarily would never be able to use so i just think you know we have spoken about the dark sky quality over locker the importance of it you know that it because it is a safe place the lake is uh sort of you know adds to the experience when you're there and even down to the fact that the trees are in a certain location and it reduces wind um, so that you know if people want to become part of your club you know what are the benefits then of joining a club like yours and you know even feel free to tell us how they can become members of the club well sure the the, the best way to um to find us i suppose is just by searching for limerick astronomy club um on the internet we have a facebook page and we have we also have a club website um so you can message us there at any time um, the other thing I'd say is that if you're ever outside in Locker and you're walking past, I mean, this evening that we set up was quite busy. I think this, this was last year <clears throat> and we had, um, I think it was a conjunction that we were out to see and we had quite a lot of people walking along the, the path there going for their walk. And, we, you know, we, we love people being curious and coming up and asking us, you know, what are you looking at or, um, you know, wow. we, we're very happy for them to come come and have a look through the telescopes. And it's often uh, somebody's first view through a, through a telescope. We do public outreach in Limerick, but it's it's very um, it's very difficult to show them anything that's anyway um, kind of deep sky because you're dealing with the heavy light pollution within Limerick. But out in Loch Gar, when people are walking past, if they see us, um, they're more than welcome to just kind of salute, salute and say, hey, guys. And we often will just, if they seem to be curious or they're slowing up we'll often just say to them hey do you want to see saturn or do you want to see uh, uh do you want to see jupiter and could um, you just go back to the last photograph there again sure. this one and where was that taken yeah so again that's just i think in the car park area that's um, incredible, isn't it it's yeah incredible. you can really see um really can. yeah you can really see the milky way there i mean yeah. the the I'll just move to this one uh, actually because mm. it's a good it's a good indication of why um, you know obviously 
fighting for dark skies is very important. So as you can see, you can right overhead, you can see the Milky Way very, very, very clearly. And I think that was um, probably Venus or Jupiter shining brightly there just above those clouds. And the orange you'll see, so this photograph wasn't um, filtered or anything. This is just straight off the camera, but it actually gives you a good idea of what a couple of street lights um, you know, old style street lights, what, what the effect will be on the sky. So oftentimes it's not necessarily very visible to your eyes, but it's very apparent when you see some light clouds above because you can really see how much light and energy has been wasted. It's been pushed up into the sky. So, you know, it's, 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 not, really, it's not really good economically or environmentally, um, but definitely not in terms of astronomy because it literally will, will wipe out um wipe out your views and of and course frank you were involved very much um in the dark sky process the application that we are all working on at the moment and that we very much understand the importance of dark sky quality not that it limits anybody from you know lighting in the community or it doesn't cause limitations in any way just maybe to suggest alternatives and best practice lighting that's that's really as much as it is and it is of course astronomy that it's about and it's also around wildlife environment ecology and sustainability so this photo um frank i just i mean this is one photo that i have seen before and can you explain to us is that really an aurora is it I mean, yes it is in and the upper, i mean it's, what... it's a type of light pollution that we want to see, right? Because mm -hmm. let's say, for example, if if you know we weren't really attacking this light pollution problem and we weren't installing sensible lighting, um, you wouldn't see this. Right? I mean, it just it's it's not visible. Um, you know, people in Limerick saw this. Um, I think this was in October a couple of years ago when there was a there was the sun was very active. There was a, a coronal mass ejection, so there's a lot of plasma thrown off of the sun, which causes the, the auroras. So we knew this was coming because you get about two days' notice and you can kind of plan for it. So we were hoping for clear skies. We got them. Um, a lot of people make a beeline for the north of Ireland because they think the further north you're going to get, the, the better you're going to see them. Technically true, but you you know, you want to keep going until you hit Greenland really for it to be any way better than kind of Donegal. So we were quite happy to head to our nearest dark sky location, which obviously is Locker. And, you know, we ended up seeing a, a really fantastic outburst. So yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a real aurora. Uh, the colors are slightly different to what you'd see with the with the naked eye. Um, obviously, because this is taken with a camera, but definitely you can see those kind of curtains and pillars and, you know, they move quite a bit. So it's almost like kind of strobe lights. Um, so you get like a lot of uh, movement with that. It looks like car headlights actually kind of pointing up into the sky. So and it was very short lived. I think it only lasted about a half an hour. And to get a photo like that, it really does show all of the images that you've shown us this evening because we can't be there. You know, we could have gone there, Frank, and we could have recorded an interview and the, we could have had cloud. So this way we look, we'll be positive. This way we got to see your fantastic images. And I just have to thank you and your club and your involvement and your constant support to Locker in our Dark Sky Quest, of course, that Paul Ryan is helping us with and um, a few others as well. So it's, it's an ongoing process and I think what it will do is just to make people aware of how important it is to protect our night sky or dark sky. So if you would like to stop sharing um, there on the um, what I would like to say, Frank, before we finish up this um, short interview with you is that for anyone, as you say, who would like to become a member of the Limerick Astronomy Club, that you can be found very easily online and that you always welcome new members and i i would think that like every other club at the moment you're operating online and that you have interesting lectures and information and making it even more accessible to a wider number of people and to finish um with an invite to you and your club that when locker you know when we're open again and we can welcome you back that you always have a place and a home in Locker and that I hope you'll continue to stargaze and explore the skies over the lake. So thank you, Frank. You're, you're very welcome. And as long as um, as long as the, um, the what the invitation is there, we'll be out there with our scopes. Thank you.
Many thanks there to Frank and Kate for that segment. Uh, and again, it's great that amateur astronomers uh, can get ac accessible skies um, to be able to observe things like the Milky Way and, and much, much more. And the great thing again with Loch Gur, just being 20 kilometers south of Limerick, um, it is, as Frank mentioned, very accessible as opposed to going up into uh, the wilds of the country to find to try and find those dark skies. Um, so Dark Sky Project has been mentioned a number of times already this evening. Maybe just to explain to, to viewers what that is about. As you can see, we have these pristine skies um, and we are we do have dark skies. So what we would like to do is try and get those acknowledged internationally. And so we are submitting an application to the Dark Sky Association, the International Dark Sky Association, to hopefully get accredited as an official dark sky um, park. So you have a group in Mayo and a group in Kerry, which are two recognized parks in Ireland at the moment. And we would love to follow suit and have Locker recognized as a dark sky park as well. Part of the process is we have to have a light meters installed. We're actually making recordings every five minutes throughout the day to see how the day progresses, how the seasons progress and the quality of our dark skies. And that's where my passion starts to come in. Technology, meeting science, meeting the skies. It couldn't be any better for me. Um, so next up, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Niall Smith, and, and Niall is actually the head researcher at, at CIT, and also the head of the CIT Black Rock Observatory down in Cork. And again, another great visitor location, accessible to everybody, ideal for families, and they do phenomenal work as well with outreach. And if you happen to see the Apollo 11 uh, 50th anniversary broadcast last year, that was Niall and his team bringing that to you via RTE. So Niall, I'll pass it to you. Thanks very much, Paul, and uh, thanks to everyone so far and to Nora for her uh, opening presentation, which uh, I really enjoyed. So it's great to be part of this event tonight. Black Rock Castle Observatory, we have a, um, we go back a few years in our association with Locker, and it's really been a fantastic association because we both as visitor centres believe that STEM uh, is important for our future. So understanding how the universe works in terms of science, technology, engineering and maths is important, but also the sociological and humanities and the arts and the culture side of, of who we are as individuals. And I wanna talk a little bit about that uh, tonight and what astronomy does for us in relation to that, because places like Loch Gore really make us think about our connectivity with the skies above and the way that that connectivity has been with us for a really long period of time. So we see this sort of on, in the background uh, from this wonderful image, the Black Gore 6000. Well, Black Rock Castle Observatory was built in 1592. So we're basically 6,000 years younger than Loch Gore. But it's kind of interesting to see that Loch Gore, which was originally set up to somehow celebrate the stars, and I want to talk a little bit about that tonight, uh, was very different to, to Black Rock Castle, the observatory of there, which wasn't really set up to do anything with the stars in, in the first instance. But I think it's that consistent interest that we have as a species in looking skywards, that 6,000 years ago, we were using stone circles. Today, we're using old castles or observatories at the top of, the, at the top of mountains, or we're, we're seeing it through... Uh, amateur groups like Frank was just talking about, and we're seeing it from going into space as well. So really, as a human endeavor, we take massive opportunities uh, of all the different types of resources that exist on the planet to try to understand our place in space. Um, and so I think that's where Loch Gur really comes in uh, as a really fascinating story. And uh, I, when I was preparing for this, I was talking to a friend good friend of ours, uh, Alison Keating, and she said, oh, you know, I did archaeology in UCC, and in 1970, uh, we visited Loch Gur, and I did a drawing of the, the, the stone circle at that point. And she introduced me into somebody who I had actually uh, been unaware of uh, until uh, Alison mentioned it to me, an individual called uh, Burton Win Window. Um, so in, in just a couple of slides that I'm going to share with you in this, this is a, this is actually taken from Alison's notes back from uh, 1970 and was penned by Professor O'Kelly, who actually was uh, an archeologist who excavated a uh, most famously Newgrange. And uh, he, he notes here in relation to this, that the site has figured in the archeological literature for a very long time, but the first archeologist to make a reliable survey of it was the late Sir Bertram C.A. Windle, former president of University College Cork and first professor of archaeology in that college. 
in his survey of the monuments of the Lochgar area, which were published in 1912, he designated the sites by the letters of the alphabet, and this is his circle B. And when the site was excavated in 1939 under the direction of the late Professor O'Reardon and subsequently published in 1951, it continued to be called Circle B. So you think, okay, that's not maybe that interesting. But then Alison went on to explain, in fact, that by marriage, she is related to Sir Bertram Windle. And so I just couldn't let that go uh, for this evening in the sense that here I was giving a talk about Locker and had no idea that a really good friend was related to the individual who made the first uh, comprehensive survey of the site. And you can see here on the left uh, is Bertram uh, and on the right is uh, a plan of Circle B. Uh, it's from 1912. I've added in the 1912 in red there just so that you can't actually read it on the graphic itself. And that's a, a drawing that he, he published in the Proceedings of the Royal Irish Academy. And uh, you can see there that he refers to um, an, an, an entrance. And I know Frank is going to come on, Frank Pendergast, after me and talk much more and much more uh, authoritatively about anything to do with the archaeology of the Stone Circle. But I just thought it was an interesting thing that as soon as you start to talk about something in Ireland, you find that somebody you know has a relationship to it in a way that you didn't previously anticipate. So when Nora was saying, you know, about getting involved in astronomy, I was thinking, yeah, my, my interest in astronomy began when I went outside my back garden in Clondalkin. Clondalkin was a small village in the, in the southwest of Dublin at the time, and it was a, a dark sky area, not in the same way that Loch Gur is, but I could see enough stars that uh, I, got, I got interested, and at the same time, man as we called at the time, it was man landing on the moon. And so that confluence of two things started off what is a lifelong passion for me in astronomy, a lifelong passion which has changed uh, in terms of how I view astronomy. And uh, that brings me to have opportunities to work uh, with events like this, which are really fantastic, and opportunities as well to, 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 to be able to operate uh, with my colleagues, the observatory at Black Rock Castle. So what I, what I wanted to do um, really was to start to get us to think about 6,000 years ago and uh, what we would have seen if we looked up at the night sky. And I, and I had a graphic to, to show something and then I realized this, this backdrop here is really the perfect example of what we may have seen if we were alive 6,000 years ago and if we were standing inside the circle uh, at Loch Gurb. And so if we were, what would, what would we see? Well, we would see a number of different things in the, in the sky. Uh, first of all, we'd see points of light. Um, we would see this, uh, what we now refer to as the Milky Way, but this milkiness of light go from one horizon to the other. We would see on the odd occasion flashes of light, which would last for a second or maybe less, go across the sky. Every now and again, we would see an object with uh, some sort of tail that would appear for a longer period of time. Uh, none of the flashing of light, which we now would refer to as shooting stars or meteors or the longer objects, which we would refer to as comets, none of those we, we would know, we would predict in advance. So they would somehow be things that would, in some sense, surprise us, but some sense that we might become familiar with that surprise. We'd also, of course, see that the sun would rise and set in a predictable way. And we'd see that there were uh, other objects in the sky, like the moon, that was a little bit less predictable. We could see that the phases would change, but where the moon rose and where it set, a little more complicated, and exactly when it would do that, a little bit more complicated. But the stars and the sun would rise and set in a very predictable manner. So if we were in uh, Locker 6,000 years ago, we would be pretty sure that uh, next year uh, on the equivalent date, if I can phrase it that way, we, we would see the same stars in the same position and we'd see the sun do the same thing. But in amongst all of that, we would have also seen a bunch of lights that would have moved with time. Of course, we refer to them as the planets now and planets were named by the Greeks uh, for the, as the word meaning wanderer because the planets move in the sky relative to the background stars. If you observe the planets, they, they, they do repeat their motion, but it, it's not obvious. It's not immediately obvious. You've got to look at them for a, a reasonably long period of time. That's over many years, ideally, to really get a sense of where they might be next year. So sometimes people will say, oh, you know, is Venus the evening star or the morning star? 
Uh, to which, of course, sometimes it is and, and sometimes it isn't. It depends because Venus moves in the sky, as do all the other planets. And the idea of a wanderer really uh, brings with it the idea that you don't really know where it's going to be. But if you observe for long enough, this wandering becomes somewhat, uh, somewhat predictable. So 6,000 years ago, all of those objects would have been visible in the sky. So, so why is that important? Well, there, there's one other element of it, which, which I want to mention before trying to say why this might be kind of surprisingly important. If you watch the planets for a little while, they, they appear to move relative to the background stars and they generally kind of move in a certain motion. And then they do this little loop around and then they continue on in the direction they're going relative to the background stars. And that's called retrograde motion. And um, the early astrologers who were really kind of astronomers such as slash astrologers who were looking at the sky in some sense trying to determine how do they influence um, you and me and in particular our destiny but they looked at this 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 motion calling it retrograde motion and so even to, to this day you can see things like well Mars is in retrograde and that influences your astrological calendar in in reality um, the, the the retrograde motion is actually very hard to understand so if you are sitting there at Lochgur 6,000 years ago you see all this movement above you from east to west you see these things coming and going you may develop a model of the universe which is initially very similar to the type of model uh, that the Greeks developed, which was the earth being at the center and everything going around the earth. I mean, there's other pieces of evidence which would support this. For example, you feel no motion, uh, you feel no wind. If the earth was moving, why isn't there a wind? If the earth is rotating, uh, turning upside down so that um, you know the sky would move relative to it, would you potentially fall off when you're on the other side and so on? So these are questions which are not obvious easy to answer so it's possibly easier to say well the earth is stationary we're at the center we're important and the skies revolve around us above so we've no idea um, what the actual model of the universe of our ancestors in Lachor would have been but it would seem reasonable to think that they might have decided that they were at the center of the universe and things around them moved however if let's imagine no evidence for this. Let's imagine for a minute that we had somebody who said, hold on a minute, when I look at the planets, they do this little bit of retrograde. And I don't really understand why that's the case. That's not really consistent with a simple model where everything is revolving around the Earth. And in fact, it's that retrograde, which was one of the challenges to the model that the Earth was at the center, which forced really brilliant minds like Ptolemy to introduce a model which became increasingly complicated if it was to keep the Earth at the center of the universe. In fact, for 2,000 years, his model got increasingly complicated, not quite 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years, increasingly complicated so that we could have this idea that the Earth was at the center of the universe. And I sometimes wonder, did our ancestors, when they tried to figure out where were the stars, what were the stars, what were those points of light and all those other objects that they saw and where we at the center, did any of them because we often don't say that, but did any of them question that? Maybe we weren't at the center of the universe. So if we roll on the, our view of the universe until the 16th century, when uh, Copernicus suggested putting it, the sun at the center, relied on exactly the observations that our ancestors at Lochgur would have made. They were all naked eye. There was no telescopes, there was no other instruments. So actually we kept going with the model of the universe that people 6,000 years ago could have used or, or, or would have assumed. But we challenged that with observations of the with our naked eye. So people said this the retrograde motion and so on. A better model is if you put the sun at the center of the universe and everything else goes, uh, goes around the sun. So the earth and so on goes around the sun. And interestingly, that's as far as you can go if the only way you can look at the universe is with the naked eye. And there's a bunch of questions which you'll never be able to answer further to that. And that's where the next phase of astronomy, if you like, disconnects itself from what our ancestors in Loch Gur, uh, could have known. They could have come up with a, a sun-centered model of the universe. They had the observations. They had the data, at least in principle, to the same, almost maybe the same resolution as the Greeks and the, and the Romans and, 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 and the Italians and so forth who followed many centuries later. 
But there's questions you can't answer. So, for example, you can't answer how old the world is by just looking visually. You can't answer questions. What are the stars made of? Uh, how far away are the stars? Where do the stars come from? Where did the universe come from? How big is it? These type of questions are unanswerable if you have um, if you only have access to uh, visual observations. So in, in asking the questions about where we came from and so on, you have to actually move on and you have to be able to look at a couple of different things. Things have to evolve. So we're very fortunate to live in a time when a number of things happened. The invention of the telescope, it allows us to zoom in on things. And um, the also our ability to realize that by splitting the colors of objects into their constituent parts that we can tell what they're made of. So you can tell, for example, that a star is made of hydrogen and helium. So a telescope allows you to see farther or fainter, and fainter is farther, and colors allow you to tell what the object is that you're looking at are made of. And these were the two things that we think our ancestors Lockheur would not have been able to do. We've no evidence that they would have had telescopes or what we call now spectroscopy. So with spectroscopy and with telescopes, something I think really interesting happens. You suddenly start to look and you start to measure the size of the universe. And you realize that actually the stars that you see are extremely far away. So the closest star to us compared to the sun is over two and a half million times farther away. But the most distant stars are so imaginably far away. In fact, that we can't use that type of metric. We have to use things called light years. So the, the sun is eight light minutes away. The farthest objects in the universe are like 14 billion light years away. So there's a, the universe is absolutely massive. This you can tell if you invent telescopes and spectroscopy. But if you roll that back, because if you look also, sorry, I should say at the, at the way the universe is, it's expanding. And if something is expanding, then at some point in the past, it must have been smaller. And smaller means it had a start. And a start point for our universe is about 13.7 billion years ago. So we know that we're no longer we haven't been here for more than 13.7 billion years, but we have no idea how long we will go on for. But when measuring in recent years, this expansion of the universe to try to figure out, well, is it slowing down or, or is, it, is it coming to, you know, is, is it going to reverse and is it all going to come back together? We realize much to our surprise that the universe is expanding faster than ever. So the universe is effectively tearing itself apart. And we call this thing that's driving it dark energy but we have no idea what dark energy is and we don't know where it comes from and a bit like our ancestors because we can't see it and we can't measure it can't really tell what it is or what it's made of and so one of the next big challenges for us is to start to be able to see things that we can't currently see so we can tell that dark energy is there because we can measure its effects we can also tell there's something else called dark matter which helps to keep galaxies together because we can measure it effect, its, its effects but we can't measure it directly so a little bit like our ancestors in Lockhart 6,000 years ago who had their limitations because they could only use their eyes and visual observations we've got to a stage in our evolution that if we're to really understand the universe we need to figure a way to directly somehow image dark energy and dark matter. We need a more direct way of figuring out what causes those particular things. So this is a really exciting time to be alive. I mean, it's always been interesting in terms of developing the model of the universe, but we now know more about our universe than we ever did. But that more introduces a massive big challenge because it opens up a question about effectively what sometimes we people will say 96% of the universe is made of stuff which we really do not understand at all. And that opens up a final potential interesting issue. We often get asked at Black Rock Castle, well, what happened before the Big Bang? And I remember when I went to college, you used to say, well, there was nothing before the Big Bang. But actually, I was never convinced. I remember thinking, I don't know what that means. And in recent times, I've read people with a lot more knowledge and expertise and brain power than me have indeed questioned that and said, well, you can't just say nothing happened before the universe. So we know these really interesting conversations about how maybe our universe, although it started 13.7 million years ago, it may be just the spawning of another universe from another one, from another one, and that this goes on ad infinitum. And that's really uh, places us at a place where we have lots of conjecture, but very little knowledge about what the answer is. And that is exciting. So if you're 
want to go to space and coming back to Nora's count of going to space. It's exciting if you're a young individual because going to space with commercial spaces is so much more accessible now. But if you want to stay on Earth, but just know more about, well, what's our place in the universe? Now is also a really exciting time to be asking that question because we haven't got the answer. And actually, that's what makes science so interesting. And that's what makes looking up at the skies above so interesting. With your eyes, you can answer some of the questions. With your brain, you can answer more of the question. But collectively, we need to figure a way, if we really want to celebrate what potentially, and Frank will know much more about this, but potentially what the people at Lockgore were trying to do, which is this symbolism of the circle and how it connects with the universe above them. Well, we're kind of back to that today. We're trying to understand our place in the universe. And astronomy is telling us our place is small, physically, in size. But it also tells us that it's massive in terms of how different and how unique we are. So my final point, when we look out at this universe and we look for life and so on across the universe, we, we, we don't see very much of it. In fact, we don't see any of it yet at all. And so most of the universe is stars, most of its planets are dust or dark and other matter. So most of it appears not to be alive or have any sense of itself. You and me are different. We do. I can choose to pause at this sentence or I can choose to go on. So that is fundamentally different to stars and planets and the earth that rotates because it's going to keep on doing what it's always done. You and me have options. We bring options to the universe. And that's one thing I think that's really exciting that astronomy teaches us. And it really brings us to a philosophical conclusion that when you understand your universe, you question the rationale and the existence of life. Niall, thank you ever so much for that. Um, I, I remember years ago, you were at a, at a lecture I was at and you were speaking of the multiverse and you said, in one of these multiverses, we're having fun. I would reckon that we would be having fun with you in every universe that we step into. So uh, thanks for that, it was great, it was great. Um, you know, Niall also mentioned circles and connections. Um, it, it just came back to me that a number of years ago, we brought an Apollo astronaut to Locker. Little did we realize at the time, of course, John F. Kennedy had, you know, we choose to go to the moon, that was his speech, but it was John F. Kennedy's grandfather uh, on his mother's side that was born here in Locker and who moved to the States to become mayor of Boston. Uh, and the story goes on. And for that fleeting moment, when we brought an Apollo astronaut back to Locker, we felt we were closing that circle of connections. Niall also mentioned about, you know, at one point in time, people believed the earth was the center of the world. And as you can probably guess from tonight's presentation, we feel that Locker is the center of the world. So little uh, did we realize, or actually we did realize that we weren't letting it, letting it out there, is one of the other significant sites in Ireland is indeed uh, based just outside Dublin. And I'm going to pass you over now to Claire Tuffy and to Kate for a little discussion on another famous Irish site. Most often when you pick up a book about Locker or you read an article or you hear about Locker on a news broadcast or academic reference of any kind, it will always say Locker, one of Ireland's most important archaeological sites, one of the most important. And every time I hear that, I always think in the back of my mind, of course, the other site, without a doubt, is Brunabonia and of course the monument that is Newgrange. And it seemed absolutely impossible to have this event today on February the 22nd, all about science, archaeoastronomy and symbolism without speaking direct to Claire Tuffy, who is of course, I will say manager of Brunabonia and Newgrange that we are also familiar with. And of course it's under the care of the OPW. So Claire, thank you so much for joining us here this evening. And again- No problem absolutely impossible to have had this event it was always there niggling um, at the back of my mind how can we hold this event without speaking direct to you and Newgrange I mean what you have done over the past number of months especially with the production of the event that was the winter solstice that everybody wanted to attend wants to attend and you brought it into everybody's home it was just absolutely spectacular can you tell us a little bit about how you've been coping and managing during this time of increased and we've lost count of the lockdowns and the restrictions? How have you moved online to connect with your audience? 
Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, the webcast, I suppose, was almost a no brainer. As we approached the winter solstice, it became more and more obvious that we would not be in a position to do our annual lottery and the draw. So that's usually done, the draw for places to be at Newgrange for winter solstice is usually done the last week in September. You know, we bring the children from the local schools in to pull out the, uh, the winning entries and then we contact the people. But it was very obvious by September, by earlier this year, that people weren't going to be in a position to travel from a halfway across the world to be at Newgrange for winter solstice dawn. So then the only real option we had, well, if they can't come to us, is we will bring it to them. Now, it wasn't the first time we had webcast winter solstice dawn. Uh, we did it in 2007. We did it in 2008. We did it again in 2017. But there was something about this year that really made Newgrange connect with what we're going through and what we are waiting for, which is the end of this long, endless period to be over. And we needed some kind of sign of hope. And it was interesting that people turned back to something so ancient that was planned so long ago to give them that hope. It was also a way of connecting with all the people all around the world who weren't able to come home to Ireland this Christmas. And I know many people told us that they had watched it online with their family in New York or in Bolivia or wherever they were. And uh, they were able to sit down and have this shared experience together. It was just incredible. And I, I have to say that I, I watched it and it's something that I was never able to travel to and of course it's a lottery system and uh, what I might do is I might just share a couple of images here um, so that people can just maybe even have a look at both Locker and Newgrange here and we might just start off of course there's similarities between our sites but there's also quite a lot of differences and when I think of similarities I would most often really think of the type of visitor that goes to Newgrange and that visits Locker, they seem mm -hmm. to, it's almost like a, a, a trail that they will go from site to site. And uh, most people who go to Locker have also been to Bruna Bona and Newgrange. And we share a lot of, I think, um, professional friends in common. And of course, Ken, well Ken Williams, he is one of those. Um, Ken is a, an incredible photographer that has taken this particular image. Mm, I recognize we, Ken's photography mm, anywhere. Really now here <clears throat> we have somebody um, that we both recognize mm -hmm. and he will be our next speaker this evening. And Frank Prendergast, of course, this is from your winter solstice video that went out and that you can see in Newgrange. And here he is at the Stone Circle as well with Apollo 15 astronaut uh, Al Warden, who was a patron of the organization. Can you maybe just talk to us a little bit about how you know, Frank has worked with you to try and uncover and interpret a new site or bring more information to it, the picture of Bruna Bonia and especially to Newgrange. Well, um, I've known Frank since the early 80s and we've been friends all those years. Um, he's always been no more than he has been to Lock or a great support to Bruna Bonia. And sometimes I used to think I can't ask him to do another talk or another lecture, but he always says, that's OK, I'll come along. Um, he is um, he has contributed an awful lot to our knowledge of Newgrange, particularly in relation to the Stone Circle and the shadow casting phenomenon that happens um, at, you know, summer solstice, winter solstice and the, the um, Equinoxes, you know, we have a stone circle which surrounds Newgrange, not quite as big as yours at Grange, but no, no minnow either, quite a large stone circle. Um, so over the years, he's been, as I say, almost like our on call astronomer. And uh, because we get a lot, I'm sure you're the same, we get a lot of people writing in with various theories and ideas about what might be happening. And some of them I can deal with just myself, but very often I'll, I'll um, ask Frank 
you know, is there any glimmer of, of um, science in this proposal that has just been sent in? And he can tell me straight away without ever having to uh, read it in any great depth. So, um, yeah, and he's great. He's always worked alongside all the archaeologists that we have not only Frank to depend on, we're very fortunate at Brunabonia to have a, a large team of people who, I call them our Newgrange family, that we kind of reach out and depend on for various aspects of information. And I have found over the years that everybody gives of their time willingly because these monuments are so fantastic. It's great to be part of it. It's great to be there. It's great to be talking about them. It's great to be learning new stuff. So um, he's part of a large team that I depend on, but he's absolutely solid. Claire, this photo that you have here of the winter solstice, can you just talk to this photo and explain exactly what's going on here for us? Yeah. Um, now, this photograph shows the sunlight inside the chamber at Newgrange. And as you can see, it's quite a small, narrow bit of light that actually penetrates to the interior. And that's simply because the passage and chamber are long and narrow. The light hits the floor of the chamber, even though when the sun rises and comes up over the local horizon, it shines through the famous roof box, which is above the entrance. But because the uh, floor level is rising, as you walk along the passage, by the time you get into the chamber where this photograph was taken, the, your feet are on the same level as the opening over the doorway. So it is the, on the floor that the light shines. It is so bright when the light is shining that you can see the faces of all the people all around you. And when they're looking down at the, the floor at the light, it's almost as if they're looking at a fire and their faces are lit from underneath. And when you look up and look around at the chamber inside, the whole place is illuminated. And it lasts for just 17 minutes on the darkest days of the year. So you can see why it is such a symbol of hope and rebirth. That's the darkest place is lit up for this moment as the yearly cycle begins. So it is, it is an extraordinary experience. And even though we really enjoyed live streaming it with nobody in the chamber this, this solstice, and we all think it would be an awful pity if um, nobody was ever to see the light. I mean, to be able to experience that yourself is certainly on a lot of people's, as they say, bucket list. But it is in a tremendous privilege to be able to witness something that was planned so long ago and still works so precisely. I think I will continue to enter the lottery and yeah. hopefully someday my name will be picked uh, to be in that chamber. But even the way you paint your the picture with words brings us there. And I know you say that it's no substitute the filming that happened, but we were all so grateful for it. And thank you for bringing it to our screens. And it really made such a difference to brighten up what was quite a dark December. So thank you. For our viewers this evening, for anyone who hasn't been to Bruna Bonia or who would like to go there again, everybody is putting their wish list together of sites that they want to visit and places they want to go. I really mm -hmm. do believe, and unfortunately, it will be staycations for quite a while. And sites such as Locker were never busier than they were last year because so many people, we were restricted to such a short um, distance. and. I, for one, have been to Brunabonia only a, a few times and I look forward to visiting there again soon. And Claire, when we open back up again and maybe you might come to Locker and uh, we could meet, you know, in the Stone Circle or by the Absolutely. lakefront. And I just want to thank you so much uh, for taking the time to go on this call this evening. And I look forward to, as I say, seeing you here in Locker in good time. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much and the very best of luck with all of the speakers and all the talks this evening. Enjoy. Thank you. And many thanks there to Claire Tuffy and to Kate for that segment. And it's amazing to think that throughout our island, we've got these amazing structures um, and sites. Um, just remind everybody again, say down below here, there is the questions and answers button you can click on if you've got any questions for our speakers tonight. 
We already have an, uh, a number of good questions coming in. Just to pick one or two very quick ones. Is there a way to engage as a volunteer at Lacor? Yes, indeed. Uh, and Kate has answered uh, here online that by reaching out to Lacor uh, or emailing info at lacor.com, uh, we will certainly be happy to have you get guys get involved as a volunteer. And also some questions about the photography. Um, is the photography available to purchase? Um, we have a number of different photographers involved uh, and from the astronomy club and such. So again, reach out to Locker, info at locker.com uh, if you're interested in any of the photographs and we'll try and connect you with the photographers involved as well. And as you heard mentioned there, the virtual world that we live in. So again, this is a third webinar from Locker. Um, we are trying to bring Locker to your house since with COVID lockdown, we can't get out of our houses to, to visit the, this amazing site. And again, just to recognize this picture we keep using here in the background from Brian Lavelle is a phenomenal picture. And also some of the drone footage that you would have seen at the start of the session from, from Jack O'Shea. And Jack and the team are working on actually bringing more of that experience through a virtual tour of Locker, and that will be available uh, shortly to, to everybody as well. So keep an eye out for that. Follow Locker on social media to get more updates. So I guess now it comes to the man of the hour, um, Frank Prendergast. Uh, and Frank will tell us an amazing story of the Stone Circle, his history with Locker, and how Frank, like many others, hasn't left. So Frank, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, do you have me, Paul? We have indeed, Frank. Good Very to see good. you. Okay, welcome everybody. And it's my honour and pleasure to uh, be part of this great presentation this evening, the final one of three. And my story with Loch Gurr goes back to around 2014, and I'll explain more on that in a few minutes. By background, I'm a geodetic surveyor, uh, so very much involved in the mapping sciences and navigation and very much involved in an era before GPS came along. So in that sense, field astronomy was part of my toolkit. And it was that knowledge of field astronomy that gave me the ability, I suppose, and the interest in the sky. And it didn't take long for me to become engaged with our prehistoric ancestors and how they might have perceived their world in their time. So connecting the, the dots and joining everything up um, I gradually became an archaeoastronomer, which is quite a mouthful, I know. And in cultural astronomy, there are two strands, ethnoastronomy and archaeoastronomy. The ethno relates to the studies of living cultures by anthropologists and archaeologists, whereas the archaeo bit, the archaeoastronomy, relates to the study of the distant past and how people might have engaged with their skies and their worldview at that time. In other words, an ancient cosmology, as distinct from modern cosmology, which came in with Einstein. And my work took me to stone circles in Southwest Ireland in Cork and Kerry with the great Professor Clive Ruggles back in the 1990s. And I accompanied him on one or two terrific projects. And that gave me the ability and the insight to look at these monuments in a whole new way under the supervision and stewardship of a leading global authority in the discipline. And Clive is still such a person. And he's a great mentor and friend to me to this day. And it was those journeys in the Cork and Kerry mountains in particular, and the analysis and the description and the data collecting at Stone Circles equipped me to then look at these monuments in particular I then later uh, went off to UCD um, and joined the School of Archaeology and did my PhD there uh, specifically on passage tombs and basically a landscape perspective and an archaeoastronomical perspective on the passage tombs of not only Ireland but also Anglesey and the Channel Islands and Orkney. Um, so that was quite a gigantic project. I eventually did finish and um, and during that time, I was also called in by the M3 archaeological unit who was digging on the M3 motorway at Liz Mullen. And they had discovered what was probably then the most significant discovery in Irish archaeology in decades, the timber circle underneath the pathway of the M3 motorway, where they found invisible or almost invisible traces of sockets of stone, of uh, wooden posts. And they accumulated a spatial data set of 400 concentric posts in three rings. They were about to put the project to bed. I was asked to come in and could I interpret the data further? 
that's online. I don't have time to go into that, but if you look at the M3 archaeology, you'll find out much more about how I was able to add another interpretive layer to the story of the Liz Mullen Iron Age pagan temple, which is what it was. So that was an, a, a fantastic opportunity. It was about that time that the phone rang and it was Kate Harold, And she had been perplexed by multiple interpretations of the Grainstone Circle B as to the astronomical potential of the circle. She didn't know what was fact or what was fiction. So I said to Kate, right, I'll come down, let's have a site visit. And it was that site visit that started my engagement in 2014 and a love affair with Loch Gurr. I had been there decades earlier and passed through fleetingly, but this time I was back for a much more serious engagement with what is an amazing locale. And if I switch now to um, some of my slideshows, um, just share a screen. And are you getting my slide there, Paul? We've got your slides, Frank, yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, this first picture is by the legendary Ken Williams, already mentioned, who is a photographer of huge reputation and somebody who is so generous with his work. And if you go to his website, Shadow and Stone, you can see all of the project work in archeology span that he has produced. And he has visited a number of the sites that I've been able to engage with. And he has provided me with imagery, which I otherwise could not have taken. Um, and what we're doing here is looking into Grange Stone, Stone Circle B. So we're looking broadly from east towards west. And you can see the entrance avenue in the foreground and a short entrance avenue, which is skewed to what you might refer to as an axis across the site. If you take a line joining the entrance two stones through the center to the opposite side, you have a 45 meter diameter, little more than 45 meters diameter uh, circle, and it is an embanked stone circle. And it is the largest stone circle in the country by about a meter over Beltony up in Donegal. And it too is also an embanked stone circle. And my first task at New, at, um, nearly said Newgrange there, it's in the brain, um, at Locker was to meet up with the key players. And one of those was sadly the late Michael Quinlan. I pay huge tribute to Michael. I was so fortunate to meet him as one of my first points of contact at Loch Gur. There was nobody more versed and educated in the history of the site. And he is somebody who imbued and instilled a passion about the site into me. And Michael was a school teacher, historian, author, raconteur. What wasn't he? Um, but such a generous man with his time and his knowledge. And he published three books on the Stone Circle as well. And here we have this staged shot uh, with me on my knees. One of the few times I genuflect in life, by the way, with Michael similarly. And here I'm holding a compass for effect. And we're having a very meaningful and serious discussion about the stone circle. But that was the kickstart for me. And you can also bring into this story, Kate Harold. And in a sense, Kate, Michael and myself were almost like the Holy Trinity because never far from me was the presence of Michael or Kate, both of whom knew everything about the circle. And here was me, newly arrived, new kid on the block, hoping to perhaps add another layer of meaning to the site. But Kate and Michael, between them, uh, facilitated me over many visits and helped me and assisted me in such a magnificent way and ensured that my times at Loch Gar, and there were many from site visits to writing papers and reports, to coming down to conferences, which were amazing experiences. And if we look at the circle from, again, a Ken Williams drone photography uh, shot, it's this aerial view, you're looking more or less northwards. And I've just added a few lines of interest. And if you can see that stone number one is to the north, and if your eyes are good enough, you can see a little human figure to scale. And that gives you an indication that within this stone circle, there is one particular stone which stands out 
above all others as being different, gigantic and special. And it has attached much legend and mythology to it and understandably so. And the second, the last stone in the ring is 113. So clockwise from one around the ring, there are 113 stones. This stone circle has the greatest number of stones in it on the island of Ireland. And it is 45 meters in diameter and is therefore also the largest. And I've also shown the entrance feature over there on the Eastern side and what I've added here now is stone 67 and 68, which are two stones which are diametrically opposite the entrance. So if you arrive at the entrance and look through the centre, you see these two stones. And Bertram Windle, referred to earlier by Niall Smith, in the good company of the famous surveyor, Boyle Somerville, took measurements pre-1912 to work out whether there was anything interesting astronomically in the alignment of the putative axis of the circle. They came up with a date broadly around the beginning of November, which to us would be sort of very close to All Saints as, you know, All Saints Day, that sort of time period. That is something between equinox and winter solstice, leading them to believe that at least this circle potentially had a setting sun at this time of the year. So that was a theory which persisted down the decades. Stone circles by their very nature and stone row alignments as well, um, attract all sorts of ideas about astronomical potential. And it's fair to say that since the dawn of archaeoastronomy in the 1900s, there has been much rubbish and conjecture and silliness to such an extent that archaeologists rightly would run a mile. But certainly since the 70s and certainly in the last 20 years, uh, multi interdisciplinary uh, skill sets have converged involving archaeology, um, archaeoastronomers and others who come together in a scholarly way to meaningfully look at the added information that you can extract from sites such as this, not just stone circles, because what archaeology retrieves is what's known as the material culture, the materiality of how people live their lives in terms of what is left behind. And it's tangible. You can touch it, you can excavate it, and you can sometimes date it if it's radiocarbon datable. And Rose Cleary would be the most recent archaeologist to have undertaken an analysis by having a cutting taken through the embankment of this stone circle. And if you look at this stone circle, um, its form is quite exceptional. It's only one of eight on the island and it's referred to as an embanked stone circle. It is upright stones which are butted to each other. The word contiguous means together, no gaps. And there's 113 of them extant, but you have this depressed floor, which is dead level, but yet is higher than the surrounding terrain. And from the archaeological digs by O'Rearthon and certainly by Rose Clearly, we now know that this floor was artificially infilled by about a half a meter above the average level outside. And you can see that if you look on the eastern side, where my mouse pointer is going, over here, the ground level drops away and you have this almost 10 meter wide embankment. This was architecture at its most impressive. The date is even more impressive. Rose Cleary's date pushed back what was thought to be a Bronze Age, in other words, around 2500 BC, to a Neolithic date of closer to 2900 BC. So solidly Neolithic, according to Rose Cleary's data. And this is early for a stone circle of this type. And when you look at that, capacity comes to mind. So what I try and do is bring perspectives which are not just archaeoastronomical, but also broader. And I strongly argue that in approaching sites like this and trying to get inside the Neolithic mind, you have to be multidisciplinary. You cannot be but just archaeological. 
And you need to bring in even things like architectural design theory. And that's something I certainly immerse myself to good uh, uh, you know, results. Um, because when you look at architecture and the theory of architecture and the theory of architecture going back over centuries and further behind, you can see commonalities in design now and then. And what motivates humans to do their designs now similarly motivated people in the prehistoric. So there's an awful lot of similarities going on. But when you look at Axis, um, I mentioned the word trouble and it reminds me very quickly of a story in the Cork and Kerry mountains with Clive Ruggles. We went in over a trampled fence to survey a stone circle site. And we weren't no sooner 10 minutes on the job when the farmer appeared on the horizon with his very angry dog bearing down on us and we were clearly trespassers. And we had a hard time fighting our calls to stay on the site. And the, the farmer looked at his trampled fence and said, you know, this is the kind of damage I have to endure from people like you. And when we tried to explain what we were doing, he mellowed. And when we explained we were archaeoastronomers, sounded really impressive, and we were going to try and interpret the meaning of the circle, he replied very quickly, I know what this circle means. What, says we, trouble. There's an expletive in there which I've deleted. But that's very true because so much of this stuff is conjecture. We don't have the written record and we have to be so careful and, and uh, you know, with the data. We have a duty of care as scientists to handle this data and interpret it in a culturally contextualized and meaningful manner. So that's our stone circle. And when we talk about the sky, um, Niall and Nora have both beautifully crafted together narratives about the sky and the meaning of sky. Archaeoastronomy and cultural astronomy now has a new kid on the block called Skyscape Archaeology and it has peer-reviewed journals and it has scholars contributing coming from archaeology, historians of science and archaeoastronomers. And what we're trying to do is to reimagine in the past, in the Neolithic or the Bronze Age or the Iron Age, how people might have engaged with their cosmos, their view of the heavens. And here I've got a compressed view. You're looking south and you've got three arcs and you've got the sun highest in the sky at summer solstice, lowest in the sky at winter solstice. And we're coming up to the equinox now. So our sun position at noon is probably around here. So the march of the sun in the sky and along the horizon would have been easily observed and noticed, and it wouldn't have been used necessarily for calendrical purposes, much more likely for ceremonial or sacred purposes. And this would knowledge, this kind of knowledge and understanding probably would have been power. And there we have a nice compressed view of the, uh, the sky. So what I'll now do is go to another program. I'm just gonna shut this one down and I'm gonna close that one down. And what I've got here is a toolkit called Stellarium, which is a planetarium program, which is open source and free. And Stellarium is an incredibly powerful astronomical package, which is now widely used globally, having been produced by a, a development team, one of whom I'm in close contact with, uh, Georg Zotti in Austria. And again, this is program which visualizes the sky it visualizes the sky at any location and in any time. So not only can we go forward in time with this program, we can go backwards in time and with great accuracy, but it does something else, which is quite dramatic. It allows you to build a panoramic photographic model of a site and to bring or import that model into the planetarium software and then what you have is the ability, having done it for Newgrange, having not, I'm about to do it for Newgrange, I've done it for Ballycroy, and this is a very quick um, assembly of a model for uh, Loch Gurr. You're now situated in the middle of the circle. In my previous slide, I indicated or suggested that the center of a circle was in some way sacred because in all architecture, and in the history of architecture, and especially temples and places of religious importance, the center holds enormous power. It is the place where the, you can connect with the divine. 
It is the place where the cosmic axis runs out of the ground and into the heavens. And it is a, a place of incredible specialness when it comes to architecture and architectural history. And I would argue that the center of the circle would have been extremely important in any ceremonies that might have taken place within the circle. And why do I say that? Because the archeological information shows, as we well now know, that there are no burials in the site. It was materially clean, anonymously clean. And not only that, um, but there was no signs of habitation. If you work out the area, which I've done, and you allow two square meters per person, you can easily accommodate comfortably standing 400 people inside this space. That's not to include all of those who might be standing on the embankment, perhaps viewing whatever ceremonies or rituals may have taken place. And within archeology, span it is a widely held view that the sky and the importance of sky to ceremonies would have been so important. And if we go around the circle now very quickly, I'm just going to show you, this is Grange tonight. And I'm gonna st stay on the south view. And I'm gonna pull back out. So you can imagine this circular area is perhaps an area of ceremonial importance in the prehistoric past. And if I start the clock rolling, um, you can see here that I'm gonna go forward an hour and I'm going to now sort of use the timing function to animate the sky. And this is what you would see tonight if you were there. So Kate, it was mentioned that sadly people couldn't be there, but here you are tonight. And this is a realistic view and the sky view of the Milky Way, so fabulously captured by that picture of our colleague and it shows what would be seen. And we have the moon and the movement of the stars in the heavens. That's for today's date. I can actually then go back to, if you look in the bottom screen here where the mouse is, I can change the clock to 3000 BC and I can re-engineer the sky, taking account for the change in the tilt of the Earth's axis and the precession of the Earth's axis, because the stars would have been in a very different place then to what they are now. So we can take a monument like this. It is an incredibly powerful educational tool to show people, and young people particularly, that here is astronomy, archaeology, archaeoastronomy, all coming together in attempts to how we might explain and understand the usage of the sky and the monument together. And we can do this in any landscape at any place. So if I can stop sharing now, and I think I'm back, am I, Paul? Very indeed, Frank. I'm at 21 minutes, I think. So what I'll do is just quickly end by saying that the protection of the dark sky is an incredible project, which you, Paul, have championed. You've done the heavy lifting. And these were from ideas when we first met and had a conference and we all met with the Limerick Astronomy Club and we were marveling at the darkness of the sky at Loch Gur. When you look at the protection it gets from the hills, its proximity to Limerick, it is an incredibly dark place, despite the amount of light pollution that comes from Limerick City to the north. So it is our responsibility and your responsibility, which you're now championing, to submit to the International Dark Sky uh, for accreditation, which will allow planners, Limerick County Council, City Council, and the politicians, including the Minister Patrick O'Donovan, to back everything that you were doing at Loch so well. I take my hat off to Kate and the Development Board. In one stroke, you've made Loch not only part of the Wild Atlantic Way, but also part of ancient Ireland's East. What a, what a masterful piece of magic work that is. Uh, well done to you. But in terms of protecting Locker, when it becomes an, inter an international dark sky place, which it will be, I'm quite sure, based on the work that you have done to collect all this fabulous information, we're embarking on a new chapter for Locker. Because as I say, Locker is a monument for all seasons, it is a monument for all ages 
and it is a monument for all age groups. Going forward, I think the, the future is bright. That's perhaps the, the wrong word to use. So that ends my presentation. Thank you. Frank, thank you very much for that. Uh, and again, taking us on the tour of the sky around Locker as well, that, that's amazing. And, and again, that's Stellarium application. It's free to download. In fact, I have it here on my phone as well. It's great to point to the night sky and, and find those uh, various constellations and whatnot that are out there. So again, thank you for a fascinating talk. Thank you for the acknowledgement around dark skies, but it's not me, it's a big team. It's the team at Lockgar, it's yourself, it's Niall, it's Nora, it's all the supporters here as well, making sure that we continue to protect the site, to protect the history and protect the sky as well. And thank you for introducing us to the Angel Case there as part of the Blessed Trinity. So uh, that was a little surprise we hadn't seen in the slides before. So uh, actually, before we go to the questions and answers, I just want to highlight that uh, within Locker, we added a, a, a playground um, or a solstice park, as we like to call it. Uh, and later on in the year, we're hoping, COVID uh, allowing, to unveil a new stone sculpture. So the stones and the sculptures haven't stopped at Locker. Uh, and Barry Rafter has actually built, uh, sculpted, a space-inspired sculpture to be placed in this, the park at Locker. And again, hopefully later in the year, we can all come together to unveil, unveil that. So very much looking forward to it. So now, um, again, actually, folks, I want to apologize. We ran a little bit over on time, but as this is our third and final webinar, we're going to push on through. We're going to give it another 10, 15 minutes for some questions and answers. Um, and I'm going to invite all our speakers to unmute their cameras now. And I'm going to start picking some uh, some questions here. So, Frank, I'm going to give you a little rest for a minute because, you, you know, you're out of breath there. And, and uh, after that amazing talk. So, Nora and, and Niall is a question, a kind of an astronomy based question. Um, so a participant here lives close to Locker and on two occasions has seen a huge fireball. Is that common? Maybe it's a question for Niall. Uh, well, well, actually, can I just say, first of all, you're very lucky if you've seen a huge fireball on more than one occasion. That's the first thing. So no, fireballs wouldn't be common. Fireballs, uh, I mean, I've been looking at the skies for a long, long time. I was almost, I was almost going to give my age away there, Paul. And I've seen... Um, I've seen about three fireballs in uh, over 40 years. Let's just put it that way. Um, so no, they're not common. Um, they, they, surprisingly, fireballs can be made from relatively small amounts of debris. So your average meteor might be sort of a, quite a small grain of sand and a fireball could be something, you know, which is the size of a, a bunch of grains together. It could be larger. It, without seeing them, it's hard to, hard to know. But I think you're very fortunate uh, uh, to have seen them. Uh, they're not they're not dangerous um but if you do if you did see colors then that's even more unusual and if you heard sound then that's really unusual so um uh somewhere like Gur, which has uh, this uh, lack of noise as has been mentioned a couple of times tonight uh, and which uh, has the very dark sky would be perfect for seeing colors and for hearing sounds if they went with uh, with these so but the fact that you saw two i i'd, I'd celebrate uh, anyway uh, that's that's really great to have seen those um so well done from that perspective. I, I, I envy those too. It is amazing when you look up at the night skies anywhere on the planet. Um, and especially if you can get a dark sky where you can literally see satellites and everything passing over as well. And of course, we, we get to see the International Space Station from time to time. Um, even the most hardened heart uh, has to get some enjoyment from, from looking up at the night skies. Um, Nora, I'm going to throw the next question to you. Um, I know that, Niall, you maybe are, I think you've already commented on this, but how does a kid become an astronaut and go into space? Yeah, so uh, a couple of ways. So I, I, from my own perspective, I'm hoping to get on one of those commercial suborbital. So um, there, by the time this little kid, I, I, I think an answer for a kid who's watching. So hello, Pat. Um, there should be hopefully many uh, routes or at least a few different routes for you. Um, and I think from a lot of the astronauts I've spoken to over the years, they say, um, start preparing as soon as you can. So you can start doing lots of different things, lots of different outgoing things to get ready. Um, and Niall, actually, I'd love love for you to, to say a couple of words. Niall, um, Niall was part of an astronaut uh, selection uh, a number of years ago with ESA, which is super cool. So he might be able to give us some insight on that. Yeah, well, the last time actually that yeah, we, we had an opportunity was back in the 1990s uh, and there, uh, I was fortunate enough, I, I, I got to uh, 
a reasonable way through the process, but then was deselected, I think is the term, Nora. Um, but it, what, what it really did for me was it allowed me to uh, meet a lot of people who go through a lot of different tests, uh, which challenged me um, and do a lot of different medical tests and just, you know, kept my interest in the whole astronomy and, and the astronaut side of things. And I've kept in touch with a lot of those individuals. Now, Ireland has, hasn't had an astronaut yet. Um, so um, uh, you've got you've got a competition now with the sounds with Nora. So, <laughs> uh, so this is this is fantastic. And actually, the ideal would be to see yourself and lots of others. Uh, Absolutely. It up, and I know that's uh, I know that's something you've been pushing hard on as well. Thanks, Nora. Thanks, Niall. Frank, I'm going to put you in the hot seat. Um, we've had a number of questions from Arcu Astronomy Database, um, but here's a great one. Uh, is there a known archaeoastronomical significance to the large stone in the Great Stone Circle? Stone number one, known to the locals as Aronach Crom Dove. No, if you, um, if you, if you take the, the position of the stone in the ring, it is north of northeast. And in that particular direction, you have to ask then the question, from where in the circle do you view it? And therein lies the fundamental problem with stone circles that wherever you pick as a standing point, inevitably you're going to find something will fit astronomically or not. And that's why if you jump out of Grange for a moment and consider the recumbent stone circles of Southwest Ireland, and there's quite a number of them, and they are architecturally very special because they have two clear entrance stones, the portal stones, the tallest in the ring, they decrease in height around either side over to a flat top stone, the recumbent stone. That gives you an axis. That is a clear sight line. And that gives you security in terms of getting behind what the builders were up to. And in Scotland, the equivalent monument type in Northeast Scotland have been well analyzed and they are reliably uh, interpreted as being connected with the the, the, the position of the moon at its extreme um, solstice position, if you wish, the lunastice. And so there is a strong lunar connection in Scotland to those stone, rows, those stone circles. In Ireland, the short stone rows seem to exhibit because a stone row is a series of uprights on the ground. Again, you've got a clear axis, no doubt. There's no ambiguity. And again, there seems to be a lunar connection for the short stone rows. But when it comes to stone circles in general, uh, you tend to find that with Grange B, for example, you arrive at the entrance and you've got a very weakly defined axis. You're relying on the supposition that they intended the view direction to go straight through the center and out the other side where there are two stones which architecturally aren't that significant. Um, but nonetheless, it joins the dots between the entrance, the center and two particular stones. Coming back to stone number one, it is the biggest in the circle. And if you stand in the center, as I would do, if you were trying to discern any astronomy, that particular direction does not indicate anything significant, no. So we can't, I think, hang any astronomy onto that particular stone. But clearly it had immense importance because it is a 40 ton mass, 40 ton mass stone. It was hauled several kilometers over the landscape to get it to position, uh, to erect in that circle. So special effort was attributed to getting this stone in and it is proportionately so much bigger than everything else in the circle. I suspect it had an important ceremonial or sacred role within the performance and the ceremonies that went on there. That's my, my conjecture, that's all it can be. That's great. Thanks, Frank. Uh, we have a great question from Maria. I'm going to try and answer Maria's question myself. But Kate Harold, if, if you want to unmute your camera and microphone, you might want to jump in on this one. If the same people populated both Lockgar and Grange, why didn't they build the stone circle at Lockgar? And why is Grange a few miles away? So again, I think this is a, 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 an issue with Townsland's and names within Ireland to begin with. Uh, the, the lake itself would have been several meters higher to begin with, which would actually brought the lake much closer to the sun circle. And it's amazing when you look at a, a satellite photograph of where the circle is located, how close it is actually to the physical lake. Uh, and yes, there is evidence of habitation 
on a cranog at the edge of the lake, which is actually at the opposite end. So they're, they are at opposite ends of the lake, which today involves about a three or five kilometer drive around uh, the edge of the lake to go from one side to the other. Um, Kate, if, if you're there, do you want to add anything extra to that question? Maybe Kate's not. Sorry, Paul. Mute there. Um, Paul, I think you've really covered everything there because we did have a fantastic photo in recently from Jack O'Shea and it just showed you the proximity of the stone circle to the lake water. And I think many people don't actually realise how close it is. And they, I know it is absolutely called Grange Stone Circle and there is a village and a town there beside Locker and they take such great care and pride in the Stone Circle. But we are one large complex as well. When you look at it on an archaeological map, we have over a thousand monuments in a five kilometre radius. And many of the reasons why they gravitated towards Locker was absolutely because of the water. So um, we're doing a lot of work around turning mm. to the water again and embracing environment and doing an education program focused on environment as well this year. So, yeah. Can I chip in on that, Kate, Paul? Yes, yes absolutely, absolutely, Frank, yeah. Yeah, there are parallels in a sense with the Boyne Valley and Locker in that sense and work by the archaeologist Tom Condit of National Monument Service in particular, they have noted the proximity of the, of the landscape and the uh, Newgrange monuments to the River Boyne, but not only to the river, but also to uh, prehistoric ponds for which there are evidence, uh, you know, archaeological evidence in the digs. There was water bodies around and water courses and in fact old channels. So proximity to water and prehistoric monuments seems to be part and parcel of the ritual meaning, the sacredness of these sites. Water was important, not just for survival, but for many other purposes. And I think the role of the river and the water in the disposal of the cremated remains of the dead, for example, uh, we can only think of uh, societies in India where disposal of the remains of the dead via the river. So I think you can interpret water in so many different ways and in unknown ways. And I think you're so right. The larger lake, its proximity to the circle, that place was specially chosen. Thanks, Frank. Um, Kate and Frank holds tough there. I'm going to try and summarize three questions into one here because there's a number of themes coming across. Um, you know, there's a lot of significance to various sites along the west coast of Ireland from Mayo on down into Limerick, Kerry and so forth. And of course, we have a lot more monuments even in the Locker area, not just the large uh, Circle B at Grange. There's many others actually visible from the circle itself in the neighbouring fields. Is there, has there been any further investigations of the other circles, Kate or Frank, did you know of and any significant findings there? Well, I think when I had contacted Frank on the very first day, it was the Astronomy Ireland magazine that gave me Frank's name. So you can blame them, Frank. That was back in 2014. And at the time, it was really only the Great Grange Stone Circle or Circle B, as we call it, that was really our focus at the time, because I mean, there's so many stone circles, so many monuments, a thousand, as you say, in the five kilometer radius that from my mind, it was really focusing on uh, Circle B. But Frank, I'm sure through his research, has looked at many others that uh, he would be able to answer more in detail for you on that. Well, um, if, if you look at the um, early Ordnance Survey mapping um, and in the current mapping, um, the other circles adjacent to Grange B are shown. And you'll notice that one of them, I forgot, I've forgotten its code, uh, it might be A or whatever, was actually larger than Grange B, um, but is damaged or partly destroyed. So the, uh, the full plan of the circle can't be traced anymore, but there are the remnants of a, an even bigger monument not far away. And there was obviously a cluster of circles uh, in that area. And that whole thing of clustering um, is something that was popular and favored by communities. Um, you see it with passage tombs in terms of how they cluster on hilltops, Boyne Valley, Loch Crew, uh, Carramore, Carrowkeel. Um, you see the recumbent stone circles somewhat more dispersed now, uh, but you get clustering in a dispersed sense and also clustering which can be much tighter. But broadly, um, there's an awful lot more work to be done. There's only so many weeks in a year and so many years in a life. And uh, the, the, Cork the Cork and Kerry stone circles have been examined and that's been published. Um, 
A lot of the other ones still remain. Up in the north, um, there are clusters of circles in Tyrone and Fermanagh, where again, work has been done in an archaeoastronomical sense, and that's published. Um, but there's an awful lot that no work has been undertaken on at all from this perspective. Frank, let me ask you one question here that's intrigued me, and that is, do we know why or how the builders decided on the size of the circle, the fact that it is 45 metres in diameter? No, I can see where you're edging towards now, Paul. <laughs> mm. a, unit, a unit of measurement. <laughs> mm. um, we don't know that answer, to be quite honest. Um, if, if I think of Liz Mullen, um, that was a timber post uh, circle over on the M3. Um, near Tara in the, in the Tara Green Valley. And that was an 80 meter diameter and an inner of um, 16 meters. And there was conjecture, you know, did they use a unit of measure? And that theory has been thrown out with the bath, bath water and rightly so. Um, and these are kind of ideas that pervaded um, archeology, span archeostronomy for a long time, but we can dispense with that idea. A lot of these, templates and designs were locally determined for a local purpose by a local community. Now, clearly there is contact and exchange of ideas culturally uh, because people moved across the landscape. They knew what the others were doing or not doing. And broadly, um, you begin to tread into very dangerous and uh, uncertain territory. If you try and conjecture that a particular unit of measurement or even a size uh, was in vogue for whatever reason. If I look at Liz Mullen, because I have direct experience of that great circle complex there, that was scaled by the topography that was available. It's on a raised depression. And if you look at the size of the natural hollow, the size of the complex fits beautifully into it. And we suspect that dictated sensibly and practically the size of the ceremonial complex there. So you could probably take that idea elsewhere. And if you bear in mind that building with stone is a lab laborious process, you've got to find the stone, you've got to haul it, you've got to quarry it in some cases. And, you know, so many of the stone circles are small, you know, 10 meters, 20 meters diameter, Grange is exceptionally large. And the human effort like Beltony to build something that big must have involved and engaged a very large number of people over an extended period of time. Also raising the floor artificially higher and leveling it. Clearly this was made for ceremony and assembly. Um, so the size we'll never know. A lot of these things are unknowable, Paul, and will remain, and that's I suppose the beauty of it. I don't have a monopoly on the interpretation. No one has. So I think everybody can feel free to have their own theories, their own ideas, and I think that's how it should be. That's great. Thanks, Frank. Uh, and, you know, the questions have prompted more questions then, and they keep flowing in. So there's a great bank of questions here, many more than what we get to tonight. I'm not going to keep everybody here till midnight as we go through the questions. But what we will do is we're going to take the questions away after the call, after this, after this webinar, and we will get answers to all these questions and actually post them on the locker.com website so you can reach them there as well. So, but again, thanks for everyone for participating. Some nice words of thanks and appreciation coming in from people also, so that's great to see. And Nora, I think I'm going to share this one with you because it really is what tonight is about. We are just ordinary people as they were 5,000 years ago, looking at a, still, at a sky, sitting around a stone circle. But again, it's about inspiration. And Nora, for you, you visited Castle Troy College Limerick a few years back. My relative applied and graduated from UL with a Bachelor of Engineering in Aeronautical, uh, sorry, Yes, the Bachelor of Engineering in Aeronautical Engineering. Thank you very much for such influence. So again, it's great that uh, you're inspiring people um, as well to, to get into engineering and other such science subjects, as are all our speakers tonight. So at this point, what I'll do is I'll, I'll invite each of our speakers to mute their cameras and microphones. And we're just going to cut to a very short segment just for Kate to wrap up and say thanks. We have reached the end of this, our three-part webinar series. Thanks to Frank, Niall, Paul and Nora, and to Claire Tuffy, manager of Bruna Boina Newgrange, and to Frank Ryan from the Limerick Astronomy Club. This has been an incredible experience, bringing Loch Gur direct to you. Of course, we look forward to a time when you can come back here to the Great Grainstone Circle and also to Loch Gur. 
I would like to say a few words of thanks also to the OPW who take such great care of monuments such as the Great Grangestone Circle and also to everyone involved in making Loch Gur the truly spectacular place that it is today. So back to you Paul to wrap up for this evening. Thank you Kate and again I'll just reiterate the thanks to all the speakers. Um, it's great to get uh, get together again uh, hopefully the next time we might actually be in a physical location and have a crowd in front of us um, and actually be able to engage with everybody as well that way but thanks again for that um, as always you know visit locker for the latest news check out twitter check out facebook we will be sharing this link for this webinar online it is available on youtube and again we will answer the questions uh, there online also but i just want to pick up on a couple of points that i wrote down myself as we went through you know nora you mentioned the tomato sphere and and the seed rocket projects that for people to go check out again we've got frank ryan and the guys at the limerick astronomy club uh, check them out and i know that they have meetings monthly as well for people who are interested in going along not just outdoors but also indoor sessions too um, of course, we have our Locker Dark Sky project. If you Google that, you'll find all the information and much, much more. Again, I'll do a call out to the Stellarium application that Frank had mentioned. And again, uh, one that popped up there, Ken Williams, and his amazing photography. And Frank, you mentioned his website on Shadow and Stone also. So some great material there. Uh, so thank you all very, very much. I hope the audience enjoy the evening. And with that, I'll let you get back to your own time. Thank you.